Welcome back to another episode of the Less Is More Sports podcast. Kicking off where we left off yes, last week, and another big coaching hire, former Georgia defensive coordinator Dan Lanning joins the elite coaching carousel, becoming Oregon's new head coach. Matt, what are your thoughts on this move? You know, the more I think about it, the more I feel like a lot like I did about the Brett Venables move. You know, it's not bad. But it's also not stellar. The advantage is, like, once again, like we talked about last week, you're going to the Pac-12. You're in the Pac-12 North. You have a you have Phil Knight's money. So I think it may be a little bit better in Oklahoma. We all know what Georgia's defense did up until the championship game with Alabama. We know they were good. We know they were solid. But less, it's exactly what I'm thinking of. It's exactly like I'm thinking about every time I think about Oklahoma. You know, I know they've got Kevon Thibodeau. I know they have, they've had a DeForest Buckner. I know they've had oh, Haloti Nada at one point in their history. But I just don't think about Oregon defense that much or Pac-12 defense, period, you know? So I get why they made the move. I think it's a good hire. But once again, I've got a lot of Brett Venables flashbacks here where, and there's not even like the championship pedigree stain that at least some of those guys like Brett Venables had. So it's another one of those kind of meh moves for me, you know, around the Billy Napier level. It's not flashy, but it it's not flashy, but it's sensical. But I still have a few questions about where this is going to lead Oregon going forward. But Pac-12 North, lots of money, lots of uniform combos, fertile recruiting ground. It's not a bad gig for anybody. I'm surprised you didn't mention Kiko Alonso as another Oregon great defender. But I, to your point, I feel like Oregon has a history of more stellar defensive players in the NFL level than Oklahoma might. So I can understand the move making maybe a little more sense. Also, the thing is, even though we think of offense with Oregon go, dating back to like the Chip Kelly and then the Mark Helfrich eras, Mario Cristobal kind of flipped that scratch a little bit. And he actually – developed more of a smash mouth style of football and in, in Eugene. So I don't know. I'm kind of like you. It's um, it's always interesting to see how a coordinator makes the next step as a, as a head coach, but you know, I guess only time will tell. I mean, Georgia did yeah. have the number one rated defense in college football this year, up until this SEC championship game where Alabama kind of surprised everyone with how badly they beat them. But anyways, yeah, we'll see how he does. Um, He's not going to have Kirby Smart recruiting for him. So, I mean, that's going to be a downfall. So we're going to see how good he can recruit. But either neither here nor there. Time to get into the main portion of the podcast where we talk about we're going to preview the college football playoff. However, we have some awards to get to first. And the most prestigious award in college football, the Heisman Trophy. Any surprises there at all? No, but I couldn't help thinking about when I was watching the Heisman ceremony. I'm I'm not saying Bryce Young didn't deserve it at all. But all I'm thinking of is like, is this the most underwhelming year the Heisman Trophy has ever had? I mean, I'm not saying Bryce Young didn't deserve it. He had a good game against Auburn when his team needed it the most. He had a near-perfect SEC championship game when he needed it the most. But... When I thought about guys who had, like, the traditional Heisman moments, I mean, I was thinking about Kenny Pickett's fake slide. I was thinking about Kenneth Walker running all over Michigan for however many yards he had when they beat them. And I guess, you know, I was thinking about Bryce's young, dramatic fourth quarter, last second drive with Auburn. But I really didn't feel like any of those – it just felt anticlimactic in a way. You know what I'm saying? Right. It wasn't like we got the conclusion of a great season long storyline. We just got the guy, we got an NFL MVP. You know what I'm saying? We got the guy who was playing the very best at the regular season at the moment. That's what we got. And that's not to insult anybody, but you know, it just didn't have the magic, you know, for as much as like you antagonize his stands on Twitter, Lamar Jackson's season felt magic. You know, Louisville's not a football powerhouse. He's hurtling guys at Syracuse. He's doing amazing things. It felt like the accumulation of just like a magic storyline. And this year just kind of felt like, does anybody want to win this thing? You know, 
back what four weeks ago, you and I were talking like, oh yeah, Kenneth Walker the fourth. He's got it. He's got it chained up. It's his. He ought to be clearing out the clearing out the uh, trophy cabinet for it right now. And you know, even before that, the start of the season, we were all sold on Spencer Rattler. This was Spencer Rattler's storyline season to go in and win it, to be magical. And this year, it just kind of felt like the the NFL. It was a regular season MVP award for the guy who was quarterback on by far the best team. And like I said, that's not an insult. I'm not saying that Bryce Young is a terrible ball player at all. I'm not even saying he's a system player. I'm just saying it felt anticlimactic. And that's the best way I can describe it. It just felt anticlimactic. From a storyline perspective, I'm 100% agree with you. It was very anticlimactic. Um, Once he won the Davey O'Brien and the Maxwell Award earlier in the week, I kind of knew it was locked up for him. Usually when you have a player that wins both of those awards, the Heisman's almost a lock. But, yeah, Bryce Young is absolutely legit. He had tied an Alabama quarterback record for most touchdowns in a regular season, and he potentially still has two games to go. So um, so he's definitely the truth. And I, I keep looking – I was watching his speech afterwards, and, you know, he had a very inspiring moment where he talked about not being the prototype quarterback. Well, Bryce Young, screw being the prototype. You're the freaking truth. You're special. I watched Bryce Young in high school at modern day, and he was convinced at least immediately that this guy was the real deal. And so for his first season as a starting collegiate quarterback, it's no surprise to me that he has this much success. So congratulations to Bryce Young. He more than deserves it, but not to take anything from what Matt said, because I 100% agree with that as well. But um, some other notables, I think, to be expected, the uh, Walter Camp and Doak Walker Award winner was Kenneth Walker III. Um, and I'm going to take a page out of your playbook and say he had a great season. I'm not trying to take anything away from him. But you know what's coming from me, Matt. I, yes. would, love, I would love to see what he would do with B. John Robinson's offensive line. You play with what you got. You're, you're right. You're right. And he had a great season. And yeah, and he got but of course, hurt, which didn't make the chances higher for him to stage a comeback is when you get hurt. So I'm sure Bajon Walker will be on the top. If he stays, we'll be on the top list. So more, I'm sure we'll be talking about him next year, just as much as we were this year, if he comes back. So, oh, he is coming back. He's already, he's already announced. Okay, good. So yeah, we'll no, be talking no transfer, about no transfer for him. So we'll be talking about this next year too, I'm sure, because. You know, that's the weird thing, too, about this Heisman group. Unless Kenny Pickett comes out now, we'll probably be looking at this same group of guys next year as well with maybe Bajon Robinson thrown in. So, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see who, if anybody has a magic storyline for next season or whether or not it's more of the same anticlimactic stuff. But, yeah, short list, Kenny Pickett if he comes back. Bryce Young's got to be the favorite again if he comes back. John Robinson, if he gets a good off, if he gets a better line play, he's going to be there. I bet CJ Stroud will be there too. So, I mean, we're going to have a lot of repeats next year, I think, too. So, Stroud and Young are both sophomores, so they have to come back. Bijan, I don't, and besides, we don't see them really transferring, especially with the success they had this season. Um, Bijan, oh, Bean's making his uh, weekly appearance. He's digging behind you. Yep, I know. It's, that's how he does. Um, but Bijan Robinson, help is on the way. Um, Texas just recruited five-star offensive tackle Kelvin Banks. So help is on the way. And also, it's very fair to say that if Bijan had Kenneth Walker's offensive line, he never gets hurt. So I think it's very yeah. fair to say that, too. I think it is. So next year, next year, it'll be interesting to see what he does. So I think he'll be there next year. Absolutely. Because I mean, I thought when we were talking about it earlier this year, he was going to be there this year anyway, and then the injuries piled up, and he wasn't. So next year, I expect a lot more of the same. So I'm expecting a lot of the same guys. Absolutely. Um, and then to round out some of the notable awards, obviously it goes with, I think this is, was a given. Uh, Home Depot coach of the year goes to Cincinnati coach Luke Fickle. Look, they're the first yeah. non-Power 5 team to make the college football playoff. Goes without saying. No question. I mean, were there any any other awards that stood out to you? Because I think that's really all that stood out for me. There was one that surprised me where, and I'll be the first to admit when it comes to college football, I watched Pittsburgh like one time or twice. 
And one of them was the AFC Championship game. The other was a little bit of that game against Clemson. Oh, how did their wide receiver win, like, best wide receiver in the country? Did I miss something there? Talking about Pittsburgh? Yeah. I mean, he had a really good season. I mean, statistically, it was, yeah, plus with Kenny Pickett throwing him the ball, it was – he was pretty much just racking up numbers. And then the more I thought about it, the more I thought about, well, what other wide receivers were there? Mm-hmm. Like, there, was, there wasn't anybody who stood out like, oh, yeah, that guy's the best wide receiver because Justin Ross got hurt. I really mm-hmm. couldn't think of anybody in Oklahoma or Alabama that stood out. I mean, Mechie caught on fire late especially, but what? What are you looking at me like that for? There are three in Ohio State right now that might have something to say about that. Oh, sorry, Chris. I forgot about Olave. Oh, I'm not even I'm talking about Olave. I'm not even talking about Olave. I like Olave. So do you I, like I do too, but he's, there's another one that I think – there's another wide receiver in Columbus I think is even better. Which one's that? Because like, I'm going to get him mixed Garrett up. Garrett Wilson. Garrett Wilson. Oh, Garrett Wilson, yeah. I think Garrett Wilson's, yes. the, be- I think Garrett Wilson's the best receiver in Columbus. Not to mention Jamison Williams at Alabama, who that's who actually really came on strong at the end of the year. He was that Bryce Young – he was Bryce Young's deep threat, who actually ironically transferred from Ohio State. So – Still, that, that one caught me off guard. But then I thought about, you really don't hear a lot about wide. I really didn't hear a lot about wide receivers going down the line. So I guess they just gave it to the guy with the best stats. But that one kind of surprised me. But like I said, I haven't watched a lot of ACC football because the conference is terrible. Who am I getting? It's terrible. It is. I thought maybe Wondell Robinson had a good shot at that trophy. I don't know. Wondell so, Robinson. Yeah, speaking of Wondell Robinson. Oh, David before- Bell. I was, I was ready for David Bell to get that. That's why, because I was like, why don't you give it to David Bell? He went to Purdue. He's, he's going to be a lottery pick or an NF, whatever, first round pick. And and then it was like, no, some guy from Pittsburgh. I'm like, okay. Yeah, it was kind of random. Well, I mean, I, I love David Bell. You got to stick up for guys. You got to stick up for the area guys or no one else will do it. That's fair. Rondale no, Moore for, I respect it. Rondale Moore for quarterback. <laughs> Rondale Moore for quarterback? Sorry, Kyler Murray. You from Oklahoma. Get lost. We want Rondell Moore quarterback. Right. <laughs> Boiler oh, up man. a quarterback. I'd like uh, Rondell Moore even more if he went to that other school in Louisville, not that uh, school on Shelbyville Road. It's okay, Les. He still loves you. He might. He went, yes. oh, well, he was supposed to go. To, no, we won't get into that. This is, this is one of those stories that still draws controversy in this area about the David Bell rec- recruited to – you know, you know what I'm talking about, Les. You know. Yeah. Like you said, we Les won't get into it, but we know. We know. We won't get into it because our national. if anybody's watching this internationally or nationally, they're going to be like, what the fudge are they talking about? But hmm. the real OGs know. Yes, the real OGs know why David Bell is in uh, West Lafayette right now. And why Rondell Moore was also there. We know. We know. We know. We know. But anyways, right. be- before oh, yeah, we get the to the question. college football playoff, on to some other bowl games, which, Matt, I'm very disappointed that neither one of my teams are in a bowl game right now. So, might as well talk about the local teams. Kentucky yeah, plays in the Verbo Citrus Bowl on Iowa in a New Year's Six Bowl. Kentucky is a three-point favorite with an over-under set at 44. Matt, thoughts on this game? I like Kentucky. I mean, Iowa is a typical Iowa team. They just ground and pound and ground and pound. And they have to get turnovers. That's the one thing about Iowa. When I was watching them in the Michigan game and when I watched them in the first game of the year against Indiana, it was very clear that they re- if they get a turnover, they're a different team. If they don't get turnovers, no, it's not happening. So I like Kentucky. I think Kentucky has a little bit more of a – has a little bit less of a one-dimensional type offense, and they have a good defense to go with it. You've got Wondell Robinson. You've got Levis. You've got uh, – Rodriguez, you've got we've got good enough players on that team to definitely beat Iowa. That's for sure. Now the other local team, which is Louisville and Air Force, I don't even know how to break it down because I don't even think I've watched Air Force play this year. What I do know about Air Force and what I do know about U of L is that that game will be over in sixty minutes because I don't think a single pass will be thrown the entire ball game. I would not be surprised if every freaking play 
was if Malik Cunningham plays, was just Malik Cunningham running and running and running, and then Air Force running a triple action offense every play of the game. I would not be surprised if this game was over in an hour, which is good because it's also on the same day of the Louisville-Kentucky rivalry basketball game, which I know everyone's looking forward to. So that's really all I can think about that U of L game is how quickly will it be over? <laughs> because there's going to be so much running, so much running. With Kentucky and Iowa, I'm 100% with you. And it comes down to that Iowa predicates off the turnovers. Kentucky, Look, Kentucky with Chris Rodriguez and Gavassi Smoke in the backfield, they don't need to throw the ball a lot. They are more obviously more than capable with what Levis, the quarterback, and Wandell Robinson is an option to throw to. But they're a very ground and pound style of offense. They predicate off the run first, and they don't turn the ball over very much. So I do like Kentucky in that matchup as well. Um, I like Louisville over Air Force because I think Louisville has – too many playmakers on the outside for Air Force to keep up with. So I ironically have both teams from the Bluegrass State winning in bowl games. So now that that's out of the way, now let's finally get into the main portion of the podcast. And we will get into the college football playoff. And we will start with the one and four matchup between Cincinnati and Alabama. And the storylines in here. Cincy is the first non-Power 5 school to make the college football playoff, going 13-0 on the season. Coach of the year Luke, Fick- Luke Fickle leads a squad into the promised land. Quarterback Desmond Ritter and a halfback Jerome Ford lead the offense, while the Bearcat defense ranks seventh in total defense. They are currently 13.5-point underdogs. Do the Bearcats have a chance against the Tide, Matt? I mean... Yes. I mean, that's the way you have to say it. You can't just be like, no, there is no way they're going to win this game ever, period, end the statement. So, I mean, if there, yes, there is a way they're going, they could win the game. Will that happen? Probably not. I mean, Alabama is arguably is the hottest team in the world right now, across sports, I feel like, even hotter than Golden State. Cincinnati isn't a bad team, don't get me wrong, but they're going to lose probably by around 21 points because Alabama has the Heisman Trophy winner. They have the they have all those receivers we talked about. Their names escape me. They've got one of the best defensive players in the country. So does Cincinnati and Sauce Gardner, but that's a story for another time. You can only guard one guy at a time. So yes, there is a way they can win the game. I just don't think it'll happen. I mean, I like Desmond Ritter. He's a mobile quarterback. He can extend plays. But there's still going to be a significant talent gap between that because all year long we talked about how Georgia was the greatest team in college football history, the most elite defense in the history of college football, and Alabama came out there and made them look silly. They gave, they forced them to give up 41 points. And, you know, I understand that – Cincinnati did win their conference championship game by 25 over a top 25 opponent, but still it's Houston as opposed to Georgia. And I don't, and I feel like I'm not giving Cincinnati their fair credit. They deserve to be here. There is no question that this team at 13 and 0 beating Notre Dame at Notre Dame, beating IU at IU that they deserve, which, you know, didn't, wasn't as big of a win as they thought, but they still did all everything right to get into the playoffs. And I still have a hard time picking them to, like, lose by less than 20 points because that's just how good Alabama is. And what sucks is people are going to predicate, like, the future of every group of five team on Cincinnati making the playoff against Alabama, who beat the snot out of Georgia. And that's just not fair because the 1-4 matchup historically is just a farce to begin with. I mean, we all saw what LSU did to Oklahoma. We saw what last year Alabama did to Notre Dame. It, there's just such a gap there between one and four to begin with that it's hard for me to say Alabama, that it's hard for me to say, yeah, Cincinnati has a great shot, which I feel is like wronging Cincinnati. But the talent level is just so, so incredible out there. You touched on it perfectly. I mean, the talent gap between Alabama and really the rest of college football every year is just unsurmountable. The just the program that Nick Saban has built in his time in um, Tuscaloosa is just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, 
And what's even scarier, Matt, is that they don't seem to be falling off at all. They seem to be getting better. They seem to be adapting to modern offenses and modern and and modern NFL offenses and becoming even more explosive. So, yeah, yeah. I, I think it was a great it was a great prediction for me to have Cincinnati in the college football playoff. They just have to. They are just now, unfortunately, going to go against the best program, arguably ever. I mean. I can't think of another program in college football history that has put on the type of run that these Nick Saban Crimson Tide have over the last decade. Um, And what's going to be really more unfortunate is, as you alluded to in a previous podcast, despite a 21 points per game differential in the 1-4 matchup on average, Cincinnati is going to be judged differently just because they're a non-Power 5 school. And that's not fair because, okay, we saw the year LSU won the national title. Joe Burrow just destroyed Oklahoma. Sent Jalen home, Jalen Hurts home crying. And then, yes, last year was the same thing. But Cincinnati, because they're a non power five school, there's always going to be those critics that are like, they never should have been there in the first place, yada, yada, yada. Don't put any more non power five schools in the college football right, playoff. Right, right. They don't play the schedule. And it's, it's really unfair. So I'm really it's hoping, really I'm really hoping that we get around a 13 point, uh, a 13 point point differential, because if it's anything more than that, it's going to really, it's going to really ruin it for the rest of the non-Power Fives going forward in the college football playoff. And that's just not fair. It's not. Because like we said, what was the final score of that LSU game? 66 to 33, something it incredible was, like that. And the only reason it was 33 is just because Oklahoma was scoring late. Yeah. LSU let up a little bit. I mean, if they, because- if they head to the medal, it's, it's 100 to zero probably. Yeah. It, it was just something else. And then last year was just boring. It was what it was 24 to seven Alabama early. And then Alabama was just like, all right, Notre Dame can't score on us. We're just going to coast. Alabama just did that to everybody last year. I mean, that, I mean, that was the most of efi- That was analytically the most efficient offense in, in NCAA history. Plus not to mention, you yeah. always have a good defense in Alabama. So Alabama, was Before, a Alabama, no, was Alabama, Alabama, Fortunately, though, the two-three game I think has some it has a lot of intrigue in it, which is, of course, we've got Georgia and we've got Michigan. Michigan, who's finally got the monkey off their back, they beat Ohio State, they decimate Iowa in the Big Ten championship game, and their reward is playing the team most of us thought was the best in the country for most of the year. And now they Georgia seems beatable now. People are finally starting to question how much we love Georgia. And I think that's really interesting because if you're the Georgia kids, if you're JT Daniels, Jordan Davis, what you're hearing all week is, oh man, Georgia, the best team Georgia played was Kentucky. (laughs) And they beat Kentucky. (laughs) They're not good. We've overrated them. The Twitter talking heads are coming out in droves saying, oh, (laughs) poor, poor Georgia. How, How badly did we misinterpret them? Their best win over offensive was Clemson and Kentucky at at home. How terrible. And, I mean, I think these kids, these kids at Georgia have got to be hearing this. They are getting, they are just getting bulletin board material. They are getting billboard material from all these people who are tweeting about their downfall. And it's the exact opposite of what Michigan's going through, which is, oh, yes, we knew Jim Harbaugh would deliver the promised land to us. We love we we've got Aiden Hutchinson who we love dearly who's beat out Jordan Davis to go to New York for the Heisman. We love them, and I mean you've got a tale of two cities right now with these two teams, and now Georgia's losing their defensive coordinator who is going to coach in the bowl game to Oregon. There's a lot of intrigue here, and the thing that intrigues me the most is, I think this comes down to the defensive lines. If you ask me where the best, most impactful guys on either one of these two teams is you got to look at Aiden Hutchinson and you got to look at Jordan Davis and you got to be like those two, those two are first round draft picks. They are transcendental picks. who are going to get stuck in Houston like JJ Watt and end up having a great career. And that's really what I want to see because I don't, and thus you can disagree with me on this because I know you follow these guys since high school, but I don't trust day T Daniels or JT Daniels or McNamara. I don't, I don't think either one of them is exactly elite if you will so i think this game is going to come down to who who makes the most mistakes on offense that those defenses can capitalize on 
And that's all I got to say about that. <laughs> I'm going to take it. You, I'll say you said a lot. I'm trying to like take it. I'm going to try to take it like point by point. So like I can, yeah, so we can get everything off. So yes, obviously the storylines, in my opinion, they favor Michigan because it's like you said, it's finally the season where Jim Harbaugh has the monkey off his back and he's delivering Michigan to the promised land to compete for a college football national title. Um, this, I think, is this is one of the best things that could have happened for his career because in a lot of ways he was viewed as in, on the hot seat, not because he was doing a bad job, but because he they were consistently good, but not good enough. They couldn't get past Ohio State. So I think them getting to the college football playoff was the best thing that could have happened to his career. Unfortunately, it kind of stops here, at least this season, because Stetson Bennett and McNamara, yes, is not the greatest quarterback matchup. However, I know you said JT Daniels, but Stetson Bennett won the job over him earlier in the year. Oh, crud. It's okay. I always forget that. The we, Georgia quarterback just seems completely irrelevant. I'm not going to lie. No, it, it, uh, that's where I was going next. It, it is, it's really been completely irrelevant ever since really Aaron Murray left. I mean, you had Stafford go number one overall in the uh, late to, later 2000s. And then, of course, Aaron Murray was putting up good numbers. But really, and then Fromm had a little bit, but it, it, even then it was more defense and run game than uh, – anyways. Georgia, like you said, Georgia quarterbacks are kind of irrelevant. The key the, – here's the difference to me is because both teams are very similar. Both offenses predicate on the run, have very good running backs, and try to run it down your throat and just try to get more overly physical with you. Where Georgia has the edge in the matchup, is Georgia's defensive line. It is more built to stop the run. When you have guys in the middle like Jordan Davis and N'Kobe Dean at linebacker that are that predicate on stopping the run. Yes, Aiden Hutchinson, David Ajabo are great pass rushers, but Matt, you and I are both Colts fans. We had uh, Dwight Freeney on one side, Robert Mathis on the other. How did teams beat us? They ran up the middle. That's the same thing I see happening. Samir White, Zamir White and James and James Cooker, I think, are going to be the are going to pretty much get a lot of carries, and George is going to win a very physically ugly game, and we're going to set up a rematch of the SEC championship game again, Alabama oh, and Georgia. This is the loop we're trapped in. You know, we're just going to have to watch it again. <laughs> Because you know that you know that's what Nick Saban is telling his guys as the game is winding down. He's like, I don't want to see any of you guys talking trash because we're probably going to have to do this again in three weeks or so. So, yeah, everybody just be respectful. See if we can get him again. So, yeah, it's hard for me to disagree with you. I, I never really set a prediction, but like I agree with you fully. This seems like a thirteen to ten type game for Georgia and Michigan. It'll be interesting, it'll be intriguing, but I don't think this is going to be a high-flying, shocking aerial assault that pleases the offensive-minded fans of today. This is one of those, like, we may not even have a score until the third quarter type games. You just don't know. So mm -hmm. I do like Georgia. I do like Alabama. I think you're 100% correct. It'll just depend really on who gets hurt, who wins convincingly whether or not the rematch is as exciting as we think it'll be or whether it just repeats the championship game. But it feels like just when we feel two weeks ago, rivalry weekend after Thanksgiving, just when it seems like we're going to get something weird and unusual happening in the college football world as Alabama is blanked by Auburn with a backup quarterback, that we end up with the same inevitable the same inevitable tune of Nick Saban going back to the national championship game and beating Kirby Smart for what feels like the 90th year in a row. So it kind of sucks, but you're kind of used to it. So you just got to find the little the little gems in the matchup to make it worthwhile. So, yeah, college football, it's ruled by dynasties, but it always has been. And I think this Alabama dynasty is the best we've ever seen because – I say this matchup happens, which more than likely will Alabama versus Georgia in the national championship game. Al I do predict Alabama to come out on top due to, in large part, to a word that you love or a phrase rather that you love all too well. And that is championship pedigree. I wish we that word, that phrase. I want to meet the person who invented it just so I can slap them one more time in the head. You are way too nice to be slapping people. Don't even cap. 
<laughs> you ain't seen it coming. I smack harder than Batman in that meme. Yeah, I would do. I, I will do that to whoever says championship pedigree. I'll, I'll be walking down the street, and if someone says it, I'm just gonna walk up to him and go. They're getting Mister Backhand. He's not friendly. But in all seriousness, though, we see it time and time again in big games versus Alabama. Georgia just doesn't have what it takes. I, I don't know. What always, it, I don't know if it's a mental block or what, but they just fall. I mean, I wouldn't blame them. I mean. I mean, Alabama's Alabama. had your number for that long. Yeah. They've beaten you in the past. They've beaten you before. It's got to grate on you a little bit because you hear about how you can't beat them. You hear about how you just can't get over the hump. And then the minute something goes wrong and you throw an interception, it's like, oh, God, they're right. We can't do it. We can't do it. And then the next thing you know, it's over. So be interesting to see what happens in the rematch. So. I think it's going to be a lot of the same. Um, it might be a little closer because I think Georgia's going to have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder because of what happened in the SEC championship game, just how big the um, point differential was. But at the yeah, same yeah. time, Alabama's Alabama. Oh, geez. As, as exciting as and, – and I don't know. I'm going to be honest, man. This might be – up until the, the national championship game is actually finally played, this might be the last episode that we do on college football for the season. So we yeah. can just do a quick little rundown on the season. Um, obviously every year had its exciting moments or whatever, but in general, is it just me or was this like from a storyline perspective, kind of a boring season altogether? It was, I mean, it, it really was. Cause I mean, I'm trying to think right now, were there any compelling storylines that kept us interested in the college football season? And there really weren't, I mean, it was interesting to watch Clemson be bad, but even like the opening weekend which was billed as, like, the greatest opening weekend in college football history, was full of, like, these defensive struggles with Georgia and Clemson and Alabama and whatever, and Louisville getting blown out by Ole Miss. And it just wasn't that intriguing. There were only a handful of games that really, excuse me, that really kind of stick with you after you watch them. I mean, and half of them came in the latter part of the season. Because, I mean, that Big 12 championship game was one of the most interesting games we had seen in a while rivalry weekend was full of good games but before that i'm sure there were good games but none of them stuck at stood out i mean rivalry week always has good games i mean that's every year yeah. though and that's, so that makes it even less impressive so i mean obviously cincinnati was a storyline to watch going in because we knew they were good we knew they had that match with notre dame they won the matchup with notre dame so they get to go to the they got to go to the playoff because of that. But Matt, there really there really weren't a lot of good storylines. Most of the storylines that we thought were interesting were just based on catastrophic failure. Yeah. The Spencer Rattler saga saga was one thing. The Clemson being bad was one thing. I mean, Ohio State losing early on was one thing. We really didn't have a lot of like, oh hey, look at that. So and so, like Indiana. Like in the COVID season where they beat Penn State and they beat Michigan and everyone was like, oh, man, this could be the start of something big. That was a story, that was yeah. a great story. And there were, we didn't have anything like that. The cute, the fun story we had was UTSA going 11-0 and and being Conference USA champions until they weren't, until they lost their last game. So there were a lot of cute stories, but none that really stood out to be like, oh, this is going to be something we remember forever. The one thing that they're the one things we're gonna the few things we're gonna remember are the seasons that came up short, like Texas collapsing, Clemson not being as good, things like that. No offense to you, buddy. No, I'm taking. And crap, I lost my other point. And it being like 2007, everybody who got to number two just started to lose. I mean, Michigan State had a good story. Purdue comes in and Molly wamps them. Mm -hmm. uh, Everybody had a good story. Oklahoma State had a chance to get in the playoff, ran out of bounds, and didn't hit the pylon. I mean, it's a it's exactly like 2007, but without the fun teams. You know, there's no Kansas or Missouri that's like, holy cow, they're number two. Yeah, it was just a blue. It was just the blue bloods being inefficient until the last second. So I mean, yeah, it this season lacked that great storyline, the shocking team, the top ten, other than and even Cincinnati. As good as they were, we knew they were going to do this. We were predicting they were going to be in a New Year's Six game in August. So it's not which, even which shocking one? to me. 
we don't have a Coastal Carolina or a Zach Wilson at BYU this year. It's just blue bloods doing blue blood things and then choking and then being back to being a blue blood two weeks later. It's 2007, but without the icing is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, Les, you're 100% right. This season was kind of just – it just happened. That's the best yeah. way to describe it. It just happened. And in two weeks' time, we're not even going to remember the – few upsets that happened because once again Alabama's probably going to be wearing the crown Mm -hmm. I think the the two biggest storylines is that a Cincinnati the first power five school to make the college football playoff they're the quote-unquote Boise State of this of this season I like to use them as a reference because they after their upset went over Oklahoma in the Fiesta Bowl which I absolutely loved Matt uh, before I get into my second point I want to I want to tell you a little fun fact about me Matt I actually used to be a Boise State fan. I say that for 20 years. 20 years. Um, but they have a cool stadium. They do. They, well, a cool field, rather. Um, so, yeah, funny story. When I was a little kid, I just remember being up one night watching um, a Boise State game, playing against Fresno State. And they were just – and this is when Dan – this is before Chris Peterson was even the coach. This was uh, Dan Hawkins. Um, oh, wow. Yes. And so – it was, and they were just so fun to watch. Uh, Kellen Moore wasn't even the quarterback then. It was Jared Zabransky. Um, Ian Johnson hadn't even become the running back. The guy that uh, J- Zabransky proposed, yeah. Yeah, proposed and had took the Statue of Liberty. Yeah, he wasn't even getting any playing time yet. It was Lee Marks at running back. But I remember they had the number, them and Louisville had the one and two offense that season. And they ended up playing in the Liberty Bowl in Memphis. I got to go to that game. And that was just an absolute great game. Uh, final score was 44 to 40 uh, in favor wow. of Louisville. Um, Stephon LaFours was the quarterback at Louisville. Um, uh, Eric Sheldon really and Michael cool. Bush were the running backs. Yeah, it was that was a good time. So Those were the uh, days, man. Yeah, but then as I got older, I kind of realized that they were more of just a team. They weren't really a team I was, quote, unquote, a fan of. They were just a, a set of guys that I enjoyed watching. So, yeah. Um, Kind of like as I got older with Clemson, I kind of liked watching them when they had Trevor Lawrence and Deshaun Watson, but, you know, never really a long-term fan of Clemson. Um, yeah. So, but anyways, yeah. I'll, so now anytime we have that, like, non-Power 5 school that wants to make some noise with the Power 5s, I always compare to, them, to the Boise State against Oklahoma. But on to my next there point, I think the best, yeah, the best, the second best storyline is that Jim Harbaugh finally got the monkey off his back. And really yeah. – we were kind of waiting for it to happen. It just finally did happen. It really did. I mean, everybody's got to have their day in the sun eventually. And this is just his year. He caught lightning in a bottle. He caught an Ohio State team that, while still being very good, did have some issues on the defense, did have a little bit of a problem. We kind of, they did a great job masking that over. But Ohio State just didn't feel like Ohio State this year, even when they were still winning in the Big Ten by 60 points. It just didn't feel like the same Ohio State team. And Michigan got that year, and they did what they needed to do to get through it. And they are rightfully in the number two slot, and it'll be interesting to see what they do with it. So more power to them. But like I said, nobody thinks of Jim Harbaugh as like this underdog, except against Ohio State, and even then, it's not even David versus Goliath. It's like Goliath versus his brother, like who's also seven foot tall and not eight foot tall. Yeah. It's not really it's not really as amazing as like, you know, Purdue. If Purdue would have beaten Ohio State again, and Jeff Brom has beaten Ohio State and Michigan State and something like that. It, it just didn't feel like that. It just felt like, you know, it was gonna happen eventually, is what it felt like. So right. That that's at least my take on it. It just felt like, even when an upset happened, it was just the rich getting richer. Because mm-hmm. I mean, even Alabama's dramatic last second loss. It's like it's Texas A and M, who's coached by Jimbo Fisher, with one of the biggest stadiums in the world. It's not like they got upset by Appalachian State. And he's a coach who has a national championship ring. Yes. So it didn't. It just doesn't feel the same. It doesn't. Bean agrees. Bean, what are your me. thoughts, bud? Bean says the ceiling is the roof. He just grunted, <laughs> so he kind of agrees with us. 
No, I agree with Bean then. Good job, Bean. You're our best analyst. Yes, he is. He knows it too. Bean now he wants belly rubs. All right, bud. Maybe after the show <laughs> you get belly rubs. He's like, I make all the points. Now rub my belly. <laughs> I I wrote this show. I wrote everything these two were going to say, and I don't even get a writing credit. You don't. Sorry. You bro. don't, Bean. There's no union of dog writers. Stick to ruling the world one day. Yes, you're the emperor. You got to wait for your time. Mm -hmm. Your time is coming, young Padawan. Yep, there he goes again. He's going back to the ceiling. Mm -hmm. You might, you might want to check and make sure there's not like a ghost up there or something. He's really staring at that. Mm -mm. No, he was stretching. That's what that was. Huh. Well, good Poor job, guy. Bean. Poor he guy. probably also picked Alabama to win the national championship because Bean just seems like he would know. Yep. Yep, that's who he got. So he just told me. Good job, dog. Good boy. All so right, well, that, that about wraps said, up everything I gotta yeah. say. That's a, that's everything I've gotta say too. So you well, want to take it from here? It was, but we, it really was. You know, we're at a weird time of year for this, so we'll, we'll come back sometime. I mean, we're probably gonna go on a Christmas hiatus anyway. So I mean. Just gotta get one or just gotta get one more show off before the buzzer. <laughs> we'll see. I'll say, but yeah, I think I think it was very fitting talking about a boring season. So one of those things that we, there's, we kind of had to talk about it, but it was like, uh, kind of drag. Yeah, it does drag in the middle. So without further ado, just like winter itself. Without further ado, that concludes this episode of the Less Is More Sports podcast. Be sure to like and subscribe to the Less Is More Sports YouTube channel. And in the comment section, tell us what you liked and what you didn't like. And without further ado, me and Matt are out. Goodbye, friends.